You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 8, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Ethics in Pediatric Research. Our presenter is Dr. John Lantos. He's the Director of the Division of Bioethics at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Um, good morning, everyone. We're going to continue um, with part two of the COLA today. Um, our second um, speaker today is Dr. John Lantos, um, who is a, a pediatric ethicist. I guess that's the word. Is that? Um, um, and um, um, he's um, has talked with us before, um, and this is part of our research series um, of talks that we've had over the last month or so um, regarding research. And today is. is the topic is um, ethics in pediatric research, and I'll let John, Dr. Lantos get started. Uh, so, what research are you doing? You're doing some non-therapy research without the allergy. prospect of direct benefit to the research subject. Is that how you would Theoretically, I think that potentially they could have benefit if we were able to identify the drug as a culprit in a case where that wasn't was a little uncertain, but. Yeah, but you're only recruiting product. people who you think no, uh, no, have, have a drug allergy? We also are having two groups of controls that don't have, either have taken the medication without reaction or never taken it to compare. Okay. And, and theoretically, we can show a difference in the person who's taken it and not had a reaction and a person who's taken it and had some type of reaction might be able to say that that reaction is from the actor. It might be a good... Okay. But the primary purpose right. of the study is not... Back to the patients that don't exactly. understand their lymphocytes. Right. Okay. What are you guys doing? Do you have research projects? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what yet, but my thought is something with um, chronic urticaria and vitamin D. Because so whether or not the vitamin D deficiency can somehow lead to chronic urticaria. So how will you study that? Um. Probably. I mean, I guess I haven't thought of it completely yet, but get a group of children who have chronic urticaria, get their mm -hmm. vitamin D levels, get mm -hmm. some supplementation, mm -hmm. and see if anything okay. you know, changes. So you'd actually try an intervention. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to your study, right. this would be one that I think an IRB would classify as having the prospect of direct benefit. Right. Although maybe a bit of a long shot. It's, what do we know about vitamin D and early care? Why do you think it might be? There is actually some data. There's some stuff. Okay. A lot of allergic diseases, the may be a But not enough yet to make it something you'd recommend clinically. Right. Interesting. Okay. I haven't decided yet. No, I haven't Okay. Um, so this is sort of a general overview talk of uh, about uh, issues that arise in research ethics, not not even specifically pediatric, although a lot of them uh, apply to pediatric. The federal risk categories uh, are for pediatrics. So when I'm talking about prospect or direct benefit, those are all relevant to what the IRB will demand of you, depending on which category you put it in. Now, if we have time, we can get into stuff like phase one trials, therapeutic misconception, and some interesting stuff like on conflicts of interest may be particularly interesting for allergists. You get drug company funding for these. You, we, we, we you do, love to. Uh, we do clinical trials as well. We have two full-time clinical research nurses that we do pharmaceutical studies. Uh -huh. Um, and Children's Mercy in general has a lot of drug company on that study, so it's interesting there. People have started to ask research subjects whether it bothers them that they're uh, enrolling in a study where the principal investigator is getting money from the drug company. And their response, they're not always what they predict. But so there's a lot of stuff here and discussions more interesting, so um, interrupt um, whenever you want. Research ethics is a new. Uh, great 
century physician investigators all thought a lot about the ethics of research. There's new stuff with regard to IRPs and regulation of research, but the moral principles behind it have been around for uh, a long time. Thomas Percival, who was a British doc, probably wrote one of the first books on medical ethics uh, called Medical Ethics in 1803. That it's for the public good that new remedies, uh, new methods of treatment should be devised with the accomplishment of the salutary purpose of developing new treatment as such trials should be instituted without previous consultation of the physicians and surgeons according to the nature of the case. So essentially proposing a kind of IRB-like mechanism. You're going to do a study, sit down with your colleagues, and see if they think you're, uh, uh, what you're proposing is justifiable or completely uh, off the wall. Everybody remembers William Beaumont, who did some of the great studies on gastric physiology. I remember him from medical school. And he did it because he had this patient who'd gotten, I think, a gunshot. I can't remember why, but he had a gastrostomy that hadn't healed so William Beaumont could actually look into his stomach and see his gastric mucosa and did all these studies where he gave him various things and figured out what stimulated um, gastric secretion. But these were non-therapeutic studies, so he had uh, Alexis Martin fill out, Alexis St. Martin, fill out this informed consent form. Alexis St. Martin was illiterate, so whether the written consent form was any use whatsoever, it's hard to say, but it was at least sort of a the moral impulse was rather demanded. Somewhere on here, Alexis St. Martin put his ex. They see it. It's, they have it. You see in the middle, it says Alexis St. Martin okay. put his ex in the middle of the course one order. There you go. So, written <coughs> consent form. So, and as a result, he wrote this classic textbook. Um, and is now the subject of a novel by Jason Carver, which is a geriatrician and bioethicist and so for some reason more about the obsession of Dr. William Beaumont to find a novel to go see the movie. <laughs> um, and Beaumont came up with his principles for um, uh, ethical principles. Justifiable and the information can't be otherwise obtained. Investigators must be conscientious and responsible well-considered methodological approach. No random studies. He didn't mean randomized. He meant uh, sort of, I have a good idea, N of one. Uh, you know, let's just try and see if you should have a good study methodology. Consent is necessary. If it causes distress, you stop the study. Or if the subject says, I don't want to participate in my stop the study. Very much like current federal regulations. So they've been around for a long time. Uh, on Bernard uh, and similar questions. But what sort of gave impetus to the current system of regulations were two things. One, of course, were the Nazi uh, experiments and the Nuremberg trials. But um, in some ways, um, even more important were research abuses that took place uh, post-World uh, War II. Um, Nuremberg Code was focused entirely on consent. Um, the research abuses, famous research abuses, can you name one? Um, oh gosh. It's not in the slide set. Me, me, no. Um, the Black guys one. in the South. Syphilis, I'm trying to think of the name. Sounds like. Oh, I think it's Tuskegee. 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 Three and syllables. I'm from the South, so that's really terrible. But I can't remember that. And what did they do in Tuskegee? So they basically. Like, in only patients who had syphilis, like, didn't necessarily treat them so they could see, like, the different stages of syphilis. And it was a natural yeah. history study. Yeah. They wanted to keep them untreated and observe them carefully documented so they had them treated for exams. Or be, when they started the study, there were no good treatments for syphilis. So it was probably but as they went just along, they a, yeah, and it's when came along and they it's about them. Yeah. Um, how long did it run? When did it end? Uh, but it was a long time. It was over 20 years. 40 years. 40, yeah. 40 years. Finally ended in the late 60s. Led to the federal hearings that led to 
the regulations that created IRBs. You know the big PEED study that was sort of equally, maybe not equally, was also highly controversial. Okay, so the talk was a little different last year. <laughs> I tried to a yeah. It's a home. For, there was a home for like children with disabilities, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. There was a, a long-term care institution in New York, horrendously overcrowded, and everybody got okay. hepatitis. So what did the investigators do? Never heard of Smith and Carr. Um, they were trying to develop a vaccine for hepatitis or to figure out its transmission. Nobody knew yet that it was a virus or whether it was one virus or two. Everybody knew there were different types of hepatitis serum. They called it an acute. Some seemed to be foodborne. Some seemed to be fecal oral. And so they took kids who had been uh, referred to Willowbrook went to their parents and asked consent. And if the parents gave consent, they were transferred out of the horrendously overcrowded uh, regular wards into a spiffy and modern clinical research unit where they were then deliberately infected with uh, sort of purified bodily secretions from kids who had hepatitis and studied to see if they developed hepatitis. Eventually, this Excuse me. Hi. Can I have a potential candidate join me? Right Got to sit up at the table, though, so we can ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Jones is a uh, Okay. Uh, we're doing research ethics today. Yeah. Uh, so was it okay to deliberately infect these kids with hepatitis? And Paul Krugman, who was doing the studies, said uh, they're all going to get it anyway because they're coming in here horrendously over. We're not making them worse. We're uh, maybe making them bad, maybe maybe helping them if we, in fact, induce immunity and we're giving them a mild case so it's all justifiable. Um, a lot of people think it wasn't justifiable. Questions of whether everybody who was admitted to Willowbrook actually got hepatitis have not been answered to this very day because there were no tests for hepatitis in those days. It's all a clinical diagnosis of how many people got AIDS. Hard to know. And one of the most controversial things about it, which fits into the whole pediatric ethics thing, was they were doing it on children, not just children, children with severe cognitive deficits, so the most vulnerable citizens, uh, when in theory, at least, these studies could have been done on competent adults. I mean, if the question was, does exposure to potentially infected material from someone with hepatitis induce hepatitis? If you really thought it was a good study to do, you could ask, the, and they actually, in fact, asked the people, the staff who worked at Willowbrook, whether they'd be willing to enroll in the study, and most of them said no. So, question whether it was truly beneficial. Anyway, so people then, but it, that, it led to the idea that children, people with cognitive disabilities and some other populations, pregnant women, prisoners, who, who had been sort of preferential subjects for research during World War II in the U.S., lots of research done on prisoners. Uh, and the argument was, you know, they're not serving their country by fighting, so they need to serve their country by letting us, you know, infect them with malaria or typhus or something during the treatment. Um, by the late 60s, early 70s, that pendulum had swung and said, you can't do that anymore. People need special protection. With children, the question it was, you know, can you ever do research on kids? And there were sort of two schools on thought. One was, if you need consent to do research, and children can't consent, at least tiny children or children with common disabilities. You can't ever do um, research. Oops. Um, but if you don't do any research, then all children are worse off. So uh, uh, to maximize total welfare for everybody, you need to decrease the welfare for some. That is, some children's. It may be justifiable to ask or allow some children to undergo 
potentially risky experiments with untested treatments in order to figure out what's a good treatment, what's a better treatment. So maybe you could, I mean, maybe vitamin D will cause harm. You don't know. If you knew, you wouldn't have to do the study. If you figured out that vitamin D did good, then all children with chronic urticaria would benefit. But what if some kid has some horrendous reaction to vitamin D and you say, oh, that was a bad idea, we shouldn't do it anymore. That poor kid suffered so that all children could benefit. So people said, yeah, okay, you can do it, but you've got to allocate the burdens in a just way. You can't pick on the most vulnerable. You can't pick on poor kids. You can't pick on prisoners. Um, or that sort of stuff. For um, intervention trials, as opposed to uh, um, your more observational or basic science trials, the concept of equipoise is key. Equipoise is this idea that in order to do a prospective randomized trial, you have to be genuinely uncertain about which arm of the treatment is better. So you have to be, in theory, in a state where you yourself, about yourself, or you yourself, about your child, would be able to say, yeah, I'd be willing to flip a coin. I, I'm so uncertain what's better that uh, pure randomization uh, is acceptable. Um, problem with equipoise is in order to be, if there is a treatment that's a good treatment, a standard treatment for something, in order to be genuinely uncertain about whether an experimental treatment is uh, roughly equivalent to the standard treatment, you need to know something about the experimental treatment. So how can you know enough about the experimental treatment to think that it's equivalent without being able to know enough about the experimental treatment to say it's better or worse. And so, um, you know, this is the question that comes up over and over again in randomized trials. When do you know enough to say it's okay to do a study? And then when do you know enough to say one treatment's clearly better than the other? Somebody comes up with an idea. Let's do ECMO. Let's do a new cancer chemotherapy. Let's do vitamin D. So when I say, how do you know vitamin D helps? You said, oh, there's been some prior research. So the prior research is enough to make you think, maybe, maybe, but not enough to make you think, absolutely. So you want to do another study. Well, what if your study is pretty good and suggests some benefits? Could somebody do another study? And could you randomize people to vitamin D or placebo? When do you get nudged out of this? of genuine uncertainty. Um, hard to know. So what people have come up with on that one is that you don't need to be in a state of individual equipoise. What you need is a state of community equipoise. Community equipoise is what exists more often in clinical trials where there are factions within the community of experts. So a group of allergists who say, absolutely, vitamin D, I've looked at the data. There's biologic plausibility. I want to put all my kids on it. I don't need any more studies. And another group of allergists says, all those previous studies suck. We don't know anything about vitamin D. We need many more studies. I wouldn't put my kid on this if you paid me. You have community equipoise then. You can say to your patient, I actually think this is really good, but uh, half my colleagues think it's really bad. The only way we can figure it out is to randomize your kid, and that's uh, probably ethically acceptable as well. This comes up over and over again in, like, NICU and PICU treatment, cerebral hypothermia, when do you know enough to say, this is good, every baby should get it. Equipoise is tricky for patients, too, because if you're going to get their consent, they also have to be in enough state of genuine uncertainty that they're willing to be randomized or let their kid be randomized. 
that both doctors and patients have to be uh, uh, on that knife edge of uncertainty. Uh, and there are studies where docs have been in equipoise and patients have not. And you can't enroll people. So one of the famous ones in surgical history was uh, in the earth when, when lumpectomy was first coming along for breast cancer and the standard treatment was radical mastectomy. And somebody said, no, you don't have to do a radical mastectomy, just a lumpectomy with you. And oncology surgeons were at each other's throats. I mean, the radical mastectomy people were passionately in favor and the lumpectomy people were passionately in favor. And they said, let's do a clinical trial. And they couldn't enroll anybody because uh, all the patients had a strong preference, even in the absence of evidence. Some women said, you know, Radical mastectomy is the way to go. That's what I want. Others say, no, no, no. I like it. But it's hard to, hard to do a trial. Uh, and to start a trial and to stop. So those are examples. Uh, is it worth going through ECMO as a case study of equipoise? We'll go through very quickly. Uh, not because you all care about ECMO, I don't think, but because it is an interesting example of uh, how this happened. When ECMO first came along, people said, let's do it in adults with ARDS because it's better to try things in adults than in kids. It made sense that it would work in adults. Somebody, there was one case report in the New England Journal in 1968. Everybody got all excited, and the NIH funded a multi-center prospective randomized trial of ECMO versus standard ventilator management for adults with ARDS. 90 patients enrolled, nine centers, no different study was stopped. At the same time, Bob Bartlett, who was at UCLA and then moved to Michigan, said, I think this would work better in babies. People said, like, you're crazy. Why would it work better in babies? And he said, adults who get ARDS had healthy lungs and then something bad happened to them. Babies are growing healthy lungs. So all you have to do is tide them over while they grow, and if their bones grow, so if it's preemies or babies with meconium aspiration or pulmonary hypoplasia from congenital diaphragmatic hernia, I think this will work. And he did a non-randomized trial and just said, let's put a bunch of babies um, on this and reported success compared to historical controls. And he said, this really works. And these were his data uncontrolled study. The historical controls used data from the University of Michigan um, NICU, and they looked retrospectively, and they said if babies are on 100% oxygen, and they're, they didn't have O2 sats back then, but their PaO2 is below whatever, and if they have a pneumothorax, they have a mortality rate of 90%. Almost all of them died. That's our eligibility criteria, and then they started reporting 30% survival, 40% survival. By 1986, 70% survival. I said, clearly, this Green tea, maybe? Is that a for a G I submitted it, do thanks. <laughs> Remote partners. You, your microphone. Um. And people said, no, 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 you're using old historical data, and the care is not much better between 1973 and 1986. Um, Got to do a randomized, prospective randomized control trial. And Bartlett said, I can't randomize babies to death. I mean, I'm not in equipoise. I know I can save these babies. It would be unethical to do a randomized control trial. Oh. Um, Uh, so, he consulted with his great statisticians in Michigan, and Bartlett consulted with his statisticians, and they said, we have a study designed for you that will answer this question definitively and minimize the number of kids who have to die. It's called play the winner. How does it work? First patient, you flip a coin, 50-50. They get ECMO and live, the chance of the next baby getting ECMO when you do the randomization will be weighted towards ECMO. If they get ECMO and die, the next 
randomization will be weighted towards standard therapy. So play the winner each time. And uh, the statistician, there was a whole issue of the Journal of the American Statistical Association looking at this and saying, like, yes, this is a better way to get to statistical significance uh, with a certain power without um, randomizing so many patients. Did the study, the first patient got standard therapy and died, the next 11 got ECMO and lived, and Bartlett said, see, now I've proven it. Anybody nudged out of equipoise here? So pediatricians were not, ECMO docs were. Um, ECMO took off in the U.S. In England, they said, no, 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 that doesn't count. That's not a good study. We're going to do a real traditional, fully randomized thing, multi-center, prospective, 185 babies, and they found the same thing. 30% mortality with ECMO, 60% mortality with conventional therapy. And they said, okay, now we're convinced. Because that solved the equipoise problem. Pretty convincing uh, evidence. Um, Bill Silverman was a neonatologist who was a passionate advocate for better evidence-based medicine. Um, and he said, okay, now they've done a randomized controlled trial. I actually argued with them and said they shouldn't have done the trial in the first place because the existing data was so strong that no reasonable person should have been in equipoise anymore and they shouldn't have randomized. But you could almost make a third argument which is a more traditional scientific argument that if you do one good experiment, that doesn't prove anything. You have to repeat the experiment. It's what you know basic scientists do all the time. You report your results on lymphocyte stuff. Somebody else is going to. That's why you have the long method section. They can tell somebody exactly what you did, and they can try to repeat it. And if five people, ten people do the same thing, then you've got yourself a fact. Clinical research, we don't do that because of this trade-off between science and ethics. Could say, okay, one good study on ECMO, let's do another one and see if it confirms the results. And in fact, when you do studies like that, uh, often you find different results. The world's full of simultaneous prospective randomized control trials to give conflicting results. So we don't actually do terrific um, science. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, because it's sort of the same story as ECMO. And there's some other more interesting stuff. But basically, hypothermia, uh, people did small studies. They showed some benefits. Yikes. <laughs> uh, other people said, you got to do more studies. Some people said, it's already, we've done enough. We know, and there was a big... There were sort of five years of debates in pediatrics in the New England Journal. Have we done enough as a standard? Um, and what happened with hypothermia was a little different than ECMO. That sort of happened with ECMO a little bit too. Uh, ECMO is sort of is more like a surgical procedure. You're either on ECMO or you're not. It's a one-time thing. If you do, we can do it. Hypothermia is more like a drug. How cold for how long? just head cooling versus whole body cooling, so dose response kinds of effects. And so people said, you know, if you do one study, that just suggests the next step. And you try to find the optimum regimen of hypothermia in order to maximize benefits. Questions about equipoise, prospective studies? Conflict of interest in the industry-sponsored trials. Um, so our IRB, most IRBs, um, the AAMC, federal regulations, say if you have a conflict of interest and you're an investigator, you have to tell people about it uh, when they consent to the study. Suppose there's exist any significant financial conflict of interest held by covered individuals conducting human subjects research. 
Uh, do we do that? Sort of. I mean, we have it in the written consent form, but it turns out um, there's all sorts of conflicts in figuring out sort of which conflicts are material and how to explain them and whether people actually um, find them relevant is um, less straightforward. Why do people um, think it's important to disclose conflicts of interest? Well, the standard ethical answer is promote autonomy, which is sort of a procedural answer. People have the right to information. You can't act autonomously unless you have all the information that's relevant to making an autonomous decision. If you, as an autonomous agent, think you would not want to enroll in a study if you knew that your investigator held a patent for the study drug, you have a right to know that. Um, probably the more common reason that people actually disclose is to avoid liability. Um, you know, if I tell you I hold that, then you sign up for it. Something bad happens. Um, you signed up for it, so you can't sue me anymore. Um, and some people say disclosure works uh, as a sort of shame-based deterrent to having conflicts of interest in the first place. So having to say that you own 10,000 shares of stock in the company your study might make you not want to be an investigator. Um, so what do um, potential study subjects say about conflict of interest? This is an interesting study where they um, found thousands of adults with diabetes or asthma, and they gave them various disclosure statements theoretical study. If somebody approached you, so they had patients who were, you know, had a disease, so for the population of people for whom you might imagine somebody might come to them and ask them to begin a study, and said, uh, so what if we said to you, uh, well, well, I'll show you what they said, but they tried to categorize the types of conflict of interest or the types of disclosure as generic per capita payments, that is, investigators paid per enrollee. Um, getting money outside the study, that is not per capita payments, but we're going to give your lab $50,000 uh, because you're willing to participate in the study. Researcher on stock or the institution on stock. So this is the generic one. I want you to enroll in a study. Dr. Smith, the person leading this study, might benefit financially from this. The administration at Wellbe Medical Center has reviewed the possibility of financial interest. And they think it's not likely to affect your safety, but if you'd like more information, ask the study coordinator. Pretty vague. Yeah, there's conflict of interest potential. For capital payments, Dr. Smith might benefit financially. Acme Pharmaceutical pays Dr. Smith for study supplies, staff salaries, and for each person who agrees to participate. This amount of money is just enough to cost to cover the cost of running the study. If you're willing to participate. Dr. Smith, the person leading this study, receives money from Acme Pharmaceuticals for consulting, giving speeches. He's in the Speaker's Bureau, and he might get thousands of dollars for this work. I want to sign up for the study. Dr. Smith owns stock in Acme Pharmaceuticals. He can gain or lose money depending on the results of this study. Or Dr. Smith, um, uh, oh no, Dr. Smith doesn't own uh, stock. That's okay. But Wellbe Medical Center has this stock in its endowment. Um, and part of what they found was most potential study subjects uh, couldn't care less. Um, most of them weren't surprised to learn that there were conflicts of interest. They were a little bothered by stock, but even that was um, not a whole lot. It was the sort of data they found. Interestingly, they found people weren't bothered um, uh, in the sense of being willing to participate in the study. A lot of people said, yeah, I, 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 want, to, I want to know that. I'm glad you told me. Off to your next interview. Thank you. So 
Does the investigator have a patent? Yeah, do you want to know? About half the people. No, I don't want to know. Why not? None of my business wouldn't matter anyway. Uh, stop, about the same. Consulting, most people don't care. Uh, I need to invest myself. Yeah. <laughs> so much disclosure, but, but when you have too much interest in a, in a product or a company or whatever, when's, when's the point, you know, that this is too much, we, this isn't, we can't do this study? Because, I mean, they ask you, you know, if you have 
more than ten thousand dollars and whatever is usually kind of the thing for most of these things <clears throat> you can sign up but I mean if you're if you're doing the study and you think it's a reasonable study but you also have a patent on it and you're you have a you know you're going to be making that does well you're going to get a hundred thousand dollars or something from the drug company blah 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 I mean what's the point where even if it's a good study that there's so much conflict of interest that you you know, you don't feel comfortable doing it. I mean, did, how did the IRB decide that? So, so it's institution specific. There are not federal regulations about that. Um, but as you say, there are two thresholds, right? One is what do you have to disclose? And the other is when is disclosed or not enough? Uh, so many institutions say if you hold a patent on a drug, you can't be the PI of a study. Disclosure is not enough. You have so much invested in this drug being shown to be beneficial that you can't possibly be objective. What happens then is, so you get your colleague to be the PI and you become a co-investigator. So it's a kind of, uh, not sure how effective it is in guarding against those potential conflicts of interest, but it's better than nothing. And I think it is a reasonable threshold to say just, you know, there are some conflicts for which disclosure is not enough. Doctors in general, or the medical profession in general, tolerates way more conflicts of interest than almost any other profession. Right? I mean, lawyers would never be permitted to take money from sort of a party to litigation that they were involved in as the lawyer. Drug companies, this is one of my favorite things. You know, drug companies perhaps always want to take you out to lunch. Try taking a drug, try picking up the tab. They will not let you pick up the tab. And if they did, they would get fired. Because they understand that letting someone pick up the tab creates a gift relationship and a conflict of interest that you feel sort of gratitude and some sense of obligation if somebody takes you out to lunch. That's why they take you out to lunch. So you feel some gratitude. But they won't let you take them out to lunch. Um, financial advisors, same sort of thing. You can't say like, oh, it's a manageable conflict of interest. Uh, I'll, you know, disclosure's enough. They just say, you, know, you can't have any conflict of interest. Um, but talks go like, oh, we can handle I'm not going to bias my children. That no, will stop. <laughs> um, but no, so the IRBs um, get to make, uh, or the institutions get to make their own rules. And Children's Mercy has strict rules, I think, although fewer conflicts than many places. So the big research institutions, Harvard, Penn, Stanford, uh, now everybody on the faculty has you know, patents and uh, they're on advisory boards and they're, uh, you know, have either started companies or on stocking companies. Uh, there's a guy who came, came and gave a talk here at the Personalized Medicine and Pharmacogenomics thing. There's a, uh, I think he's, he might even be in a asthma. A tool, Butte, in Stanford. Maybe he's a pulmonologist, but he's one of these uh, things. He puts up his first conflict of interest slide, and he says, "I consult for these 18 companies. I hold these 12 patents. I'm on these four speaker bureaus, and uh, so you shouldn't believe anything I say." And in fact, it has the opposite effect. Right? You say, "Like, oh, well, he must be really, really." Uh, so how do you how, how institutions that are more into those academic industry partnerships than we are? But I think we tend to be more uh, the recipient of contracts to do studies. So the drug company will come to us and say, "Yeah, we need ten sites for testing this drug. Here's the protocol. We'll give you this much money. Do you want to be part of it?" But um, and more high-powered research places investigative initiated, they go to the venture capital, they start a company. And those conflicts are uh, 
trickier and harder to manage, I think. Um, grants create interesting conflicts of interest, too. They're not usually treated like industry partnerships, but if you get an IH grant, you're doing a study, you want to get a published paper. Papers with positive results are more likely to be published than papers with negative results. If you publish more papers, you get more grants. So, um, but it's interesting. We don't generally tend, I mean, we disclose it's an NIH funded study, but we don't disclose it as a conflict of interest the way we tend to disclose it. I did things. Um, I wonder if, let me just see if I had the categories. Might be the best thing to finish with. Oh, this might be good. Uh, parents willing to take risks for medical research. Um, This is sort of related to the phase one study, but the question is, uh, we set the thresholds for children's participation in research uh, very low. We're very protective. And these guys wanted to find out if uh, the children and their parents had similar thresholds as we do. Um, so they went and interviewed a bunch of parents and kids where the kids had asthma or cancer. And about willing to participate given low but real risks. So how willing would you be to participate in a medical research study? It would not help you, but it might help other children. And there was a one in a million chance of your dying from being in the study. And then they calibrated the risk. One in a million chance of your getting a headache from being in the study. Or one in a million chance of your breaking your leg from being in the study. Um, and they asked the parents, and they asked the kids, and this is headache, small chance of a broken leg, and death. That's interesting. Uh, I don't uh, These are non-therapeutic studies, so this is not a cancer protocol. This is, it wouldn't help you, but it would benefit other children. Uh, children. Look at the bottom one. Forty percent of children said one in a million chance of death. Yeah, I'd do that. Uh, fewer parents were willing to let their kids participate. Then they um, compared it to participating in a charity event. Would you be willing to run a race for charity? And found that the numbers were actually pretty similar. That the kids tended to view participating in research sort of like. Charity. Doing a charity event, you don't have to go through an IRB, so you're allowed to do those things. Participating in research has to go through an IRB, and IRBs generally don't allow them. So the point of this study, I think, was parents and kids view research as an altruistic thing. Uh, IRBs generally, well, they view it as altruistic, but they don't allow the same sort of risks that they allow in other altruistic I'm sure, like parents, if it was like individual, like you know, them going through that, it'd be higher than it is for their child. Presumably. You ask them the same question. Presumably, it would. I haven't seen that study, but it would. Um, Interesting. What the kids would. If the kids would get consent for their parents to have the study. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on what age they are. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the related things is the IRB threshold for allowing kids to participate in studies where there is no prospect of direct benefit is minimal risk. And minimal risk is defined by federal regulations as comparable to the risks of everyday life. Um, Dave Wendler is a, a philosopher, but uh, I don't know if a philosopher, might be a lawyer. Anyway, it does bioethics at the NIH. Tried to quantify the risks of everyday life for school kids and looked at high school sports. That's sort of something that we generally consider uh, 
an acceptable risk in everyday life and it's you're allowed to let your kid play football. Uh, and it turns out uh, the risks from uh, most high school sports are vastly higher than anything I would allow uh, in a research study. Um, level four injuries, those resulting in emergency department visit, hospitalization, ongoing physical therapy, or the prevent participation in sports for greater than a month. Healthy children older than 500, 300, I mean, thousands of kids are being injured every year in the sports center. We think that's okay. Um, same study, they asked the kids things like, uh, how often do you feel scared, feel sad, have trouble sleeping, worry about what will happen. And they do a lot. IRBs look at this a lot, too. If you're doing something that has emotional consequences to make the kids feel scared. Um, and not in that same paper, but in a different one, the finding of parents and children some non-beneficial non studies acceptable undermines the claim that non-beneficial and risky research is not necessarily unethical. I'm not sure it does. It at least says there's disagreement. You could argue participating in football is unethical. Um, OK, we can finish with this. Um, as you think about your studies, these are now the federal regs. This is what the IRB wants you to do. Do you know all this already? Four categories of risk that have different requirements for consent and justification. No greater than minimal risk, greater than minimal risk and prospect of direct benefit with the risks proportional to the benefits, minor increase over minimal risk, and no prospect of direct benefit. For riskier, that is, more than a minor increase over minimal risk, with no that direct benefit, but really important because it's likely to yield valuable information. So when you come up with a protocol that involves children, the IRP will say, which of these four boxes are you checking? And that will determine um, what you have to do. No greater than minimal risk. You have to get the assent of the child. We can talk about that, but we don't have time to permission of at least one parent approval the IRB and minimal risk is defined as no greater than daily life. So sometimes when you say this is the minimal risk study, you have to justify it. So the IRB will say, I don't know, it sounds like it's more than minimal risk. And you go like, well, federal regs say it's no greater than the risk. Of this is what I think are the risks of this study. It's comparable to whatever. Greater than minimal risk prospect of correct benefit. This is most intervention trials given a new drug, you don't know if the new drug has undiscovered side effects or something, but the reason you're given it is because you think it's more likely to cure their cancer or asthma or whatever. So prospect of direct benefit to the individual study subject, not direct benefit to the world of children. Um, and you have to then be able to say possibility of benefit justifies the risk. We're given this toxic new chemotherapeutic agent, RALL, but and we know that it has terrible side effects. But we think it's likely to have fewer side effects than the current standard. Um, again, you need uh, to show that the benefits of at least as favorable as alternative approaches. You need um, IRB approval. This is probably. Um, fuzziest category, minor increase over minimal risk, no prospect of direct benefit. There you need the assent of the child, permission of both parents, not just one parent. You have to show that it's only a minor increase, and if minor increase is a vague category, uh, if minimal risk is a vague category, minor increase over minimal risk is an even vaguer category. Like that you have knowledge of its vital importance, research risks, this is an interesting thing they did with minor increase over minimal risk. They say, the regulations actually say, it's no longer the risks of everyday life. It's the risk of everyday life for a child with this condition. So you can do studies 
that have a minor increase over minimal risk for kids with cancer, and the threshold that they calibrate it to is what's everyday life like for a child with cancer. So it may be permissible to say, put them in the hospital, start an IV, uh, do the sorts of things that kids with cancer get, but that healthy kids generally don't. And you get um, IRB approval, of course. You have to get IRB approval for you have to get IRB approval for things that don't require IRB approval. The IRB has to tell you that they don't have to approve it. Um, since you're above the minor increase or oh, so then there's this uh, fourth category, which is it's greater than a minor increase over minimal risk, no prospect of direct benefit, but so so really important that it ought to be done anyway. And for that, you have to go to the IRB. The IRB has to agree with you. And then they send it to the feds, and the feds convene a special panel to decide whether the study really is so, so important and couldn't be done in any other way to answer a question that's uh, crucial. They put together this panel. They publish their results. There's a period for public comment. The process takes months and months, but eventually they sometimes should probably stop. What else did I have? Oh, this is that 407 review process. Um, this is my editorial, I guess. I mean, I think the system overemphasizes the risks of research, underemphasizes the risks of using non-studied therapies. So, you want to do your vitamin D study, you want to enroll kids in a prospective trial, the IRB will examine every word on your informed consent form. If instead you said, screw that, I'm just going to put everybody on vitamin D, there'd be no oversight. You could do whatever you wanted. And uh, uh, I would argue when you do that, the kids you're giving the vitamin D to outside a study are at much greater risk it's in the study, but at the same level, of course. Local IRBs can be inconsistent. There's a lot of studies on that. People have taken the same study, multi-center studies, to 38 IRBs. They get 38 different responses. Some approve them in a day. Some take three months. Some require them. And the system's designed that way. There's no appeals process. IRBs are uh, anonymous, confidential. You can't read the minutes. There's no accountability. Uh, okay. Questions? <coughs> Anybody in the audience have any questions for Dr. Lantos? Anybody else here? Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Oh, we have to fun. give one of our last lectures. I guess you had the last lecture here. Um, it, at Children's Mercy because we're moving to Broadway on Friday. Wow, a historic event. <laughs> yeah, the last call yeah, at Children's Mercy. Right here, okay. Okay. over at Broadway. Yeah. yeah, put my picture here, and then they'll write <laughs> What's going here, do you know? I don't know. No idea. Uh, yeah, here's something we don't know. Our clinic is taking over my pain management and uh, personal life. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.